In today's lecture, let's think about how diseases get around and the role of modern transport. Infectious diseases move as quickly as we do. When humans migrated out of Africa some 70,000 years ago, it was at the sedate pace of roughly 10 miles or 16 kilometers a year. Back then, it took about 50,000 years to reach North America and required the cooperation of an ice age forming the land bridge across the Bering Strait between what is now Alaska and Russia. Our diseases moved along with us. But because of the slow pace through hazardous, saber-toothed, tiger-filled terrain, those people who were, not, who were sick with diseases did not make it. So we left many diseases behind and experienced what ecologists called enemy release, where the movement into new ranges often reduces the disease burden. We did acquire new parasites from the animals we killed and butchered along the way, and amazingly, we can even chart the diseases we acquired through the examination of worms in the coprolites or fossilized feces strewn in caves across North America. But generally, we encountered very few parasites as we colonized the Americas. Later, with the advent of the sailing ship, the traveling time to the Americas was much reduced, with the first voyage of Columbus taking just five weeks. Exactly how long the trip took the Vikings 500 years earlier, no one knows, but likely not much longer. Now, of course, we can go from Europe or Africa to the Americas in a matter of hours. Because the first people to reach the Americas walked there and experienced enemy release, they had far fewer parasites than the Europeans or Africans from which they diverged. The successive waves of Europeans after Columbus brought many devastating diseases to the New World in what is euphemistically called the Columbian Exchange. In exchange for a potato, corn and other wonderful crops, not to mention gold and silver, the colonizing nations of Europe gave the native people of the Americas smallpox, malaria, TB, measles, influenza, bubonic plague and whooping cough. That hardly seems fair. But since the goal was colonization, these diseases provided an essential service by wiping out millions of the original inhabitants that were immunologically naive. Indeed, as soon as the power of disease was realized, the British made gifts of blankets from smallpox hospitals that would hasten the decline of the native people. The siege of Fort Pitt in 1763 being an example. Following the colonization of the Americas, there was the forced and voluntary exodus of people from Africa and Europe, which happened on ships. The great sailing ships of the 17th, 18th and even 19th century were of course breeding grounds for diseases. The slave ships from Africa and the emigrant ships from Ireland following the famine were both called coffin ships for a good reason. Nowadays, diseases don't build up on long-haul travel, killing passengers along the way. If you can travel from Asia to the US in a matter of hours, there is not enough time for an infection to transmit to another person and kill them. And that, it turns out, is part of the problem of modern transport. A now textbook case of diseases in airline travel is a 2003 outbreak of SARS, Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This viral disease, caused by the same group responsible for the common cold, a coronavirus, is transmitted in a similar way through sneezes and aerosol drops, but also on surfaces. Following an outbreak in Hong Kong, a close examination of 40 flights out of that city showed just how impressively the disease can travel. On one three-hour flight with 120 passengers traveling from Hong Kong to Beijing on March 15, 2003, 22 people were infected from a single index case. As terrifying as that is, what is scarier still is the speed of air travel, allowing infected people to travel thousands of miles away without appearing ill. This happened when a Canadian lady who returned home to Toronto after a stay in Hong Kong Asymptomatic, she carried the SARS virus to Toronto that killed 44 people, infected 400, and led to the quarantining of 25,000 Toronto residents. There are many other examples of diseases in modern transport to ponder. AIDS out of Africa to Haiti, where it spread in the sex industry before traveling to the US. AIDS moving down the South African highways as truckers visit roadside brothels. The introduction of the mosquito, Anopheles gambiae, the most efficient vector of Plasmodium falciparum malaria from West Africa to northeastern Brazil by either steamship or aircraft back in 1930. And it's not just human diseases. Devastating diseases of our livestock and food crops are also catapulted around the planet by air travel and the resultant porous borders that it brings. 
In 1973, two pests, a green mite and a mealybug of the important staple food crop, cassava, were introduced from South America to West Africa and spread to 27 countries before being controlled. A devastating scenario when you realize that 500 million people depend on it as their daily source of calories. What is the solution? We are not going to go back to walking across the planet anytime soon, so we need novel solutions for tracking and limiting the spread of such diseases. Perhaps the technological prowess that got us into this mess can help us get out of it. We each carry phones with more computing power than the Apollo space mission. And because of those space missions, we can peer down to Earth from space. Both the phone and satellite imagery are now being employed to map and track diseases as they emerge and spread. Travel is, after all, dependent on maps. Now we need maps to, to, now we need to map the passengers we unwittingly take with us as we whiz around the globe in our incessant need to be anywhere but here.